Well, welcome to Tough Questions. And in our 20th segment today, we're gonna to talk about how does God speak to us today? Or does he speak to us today? And um, we're gonna take a few weeks on this question. We're gonna have different variations of the question. But what I'm concerned about is sort of the extreme uh, that God doesn't speak to us at all. That's one extreme. And then the other extreme is God speaks to us all the time, audibly. I think that's another extreme. And so what I want to try to do, at least in our first time together, is uh, break down the whole idea of how God uh, communicates to us in a normative way. In other words, how does he normally speak to us? And so what I want to do today is I want to look at how God has spoken to us in the past and how, has, and how does God speak to us primarily in the present. And in the weeks to come, if you keep following these videos, we're going to cover different nuances of that. Um, eventually, we're going to get to the whole idea of the gift of prophecy and what does that mean today? Uh, how does God speak to us outside of the Bible? or if he does, and, but we're not gonna tackle that today. We will eventually get there. So I hope you're patient with these, but again, if I tried to do everything in one video, it would just be too long. So today, uh, I'm hoping this will take about 30 minutes, and what I wanna do is, I do wanna answer the question, does God speak to us today? And I would say absolutely, positively, yes, he does. And here's how he does it in a normative way. So I wanna give you an overview of how God has communicated in the past, and in particular using um, what we know from the scriptures in relationship to how God communicates with us. So the first thing I wanna say is that, how has God communicated in the past? Well, first of all, God's word sometimes is seen in the Bible as a person, and that person is the person of Jesus Christ. So that is one specific way that God has communicated to us, and that is that Jesus, who is God, has taken on flesh, and he is equal to what we call the Word. And so he is literally the Word of God who's come to communicate God to us, and I want to read a few scriptures to you in light of this. Uh, on four occasions, the Bible calls Jesus the Word. So in Revelation 19, 13, uh, John sees the risen Christ. He has this vision of Christ in the last book of the Bible in Revelation. And in Revelation 19, 13, he says, the name by which he is called, he's talking about Jesus, the name by which he is called is the Word of God. So Jesus himself is called the Word. He's also called the Word, again, by John. Uh, actually, in every case that we know of, of Jesus as the Word, John, the apostle, is the one who describes him as such. John 1.1 1, 1 is probably the most famous of these verses, where in John 1.1 1, 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that is clearly saying that Jesus... Uh, has come to reveal the communication of God, both in his speech and in his character and actions. And then John 1.14, later in John chapter 1, John the Apostle says, And the Word, that is Jesus, became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in the book of 1 John, John writes in the very first three verses, and again, I think he is talking specifically about Jesus, but here he calls him the word of life, if you listen carefully. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And I believe this is all talking about Jesus. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father 
and with his son, Jesus Christ. So Wayne Grudem in his Systematic Theology says this about the whole idea of the Word of God. He said, these verses are the only instances where the Bible refers to God the Son as the Word. The Word of life, the Word of God. So this usage is not common. But it does indicate that among the members of the Trinity, it is especially God the Son, who in his person, that is in his flesh, as well as in his words, has the role of communicating the character of God to us and expressing the will of God to us. So the first way that we see that God has spoken in the past and still speaks to us is through his son, Jesus Christ. A second thing that we see is God speaks to us today and he's spoken in the past through uh, the speech of God, that God's word is the speech of God. Speech of I'm going to abbreviate theta for God, the speech of God. And there's two uh, distinct ways that God does this. One is through his decrees. So we'll just do an A here, decrees. And I'll, I'll get to the other one in a second. But what are his decrees? What does it mean that God decrees? Well, that means that that is a word of God that actually causes something to happen. So uh, I can order somebody to do something and they do it. But in God's case, when God decrees something, it happens merely by the decree of his word. It doesn't take any other mediation for that to take place. A few examples of this would be one of the first verses of the Bible, where in Genesis 1, 3, it says, And God said, so God spoke his word, his speech, let there be light, and boom, there's light. And so only God has the power to be able to do that, to actually speak something, and it causes something through his speech to happen. Genesis 1.24 would be another example where God said, God spoke, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. He spoke, and boom, there's living creatures and beasts on the earth according to their kinds. Psalm 33, 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. So all of creation is a result of God speaking, making a decree, and boom, it happens. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus continually upholds the universe by the word of his power. There's power in God's words. And then uh, another way we're going to look at this is God uh, has words of personal address. Personal address. And this is where he talks directly, specifically, uh, to certain people at certain times. And so what we see in the scriptures is various examples of this. I'm just going to give you a few. But for instance, in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God is talking to Adam and Eve, and he says to them, uh, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you, you shall surely die. And of course that's the famous uh, one prohibition that God gave to Adam and Eve, and yet they still disobeyed him and sinned. But God actually spoke that to them. They heard audibly the voice of God. Uh, and then after the sin of Adam and Eve, God still continued to come and speak directly personally to them in the words of the curse in Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 and 19. So it says that man will toil by the sweat of his brow. And so labor is going to be intensive. It's going to be painful. There's going to be weeds, uh, mosquitoes, and so forth as a result of the fall. And then to the woman, she's going to experience tremendous pain in childbirth, and those are both results of the fall. And God speaks those uh, to them in uh, the garden. 
And then in the New Testament, an example would be Jesus uh, immediately after he's baptized, he comes out of the water. And again, he didn't need, be, need to be baptized for his own sin. He was baptized in order to do everything obediently, just like we're supposed to do. So he was baptized and he hears a voice from heaven and it's the Father speaking to him in Matthew 3, 17. And the Father says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Audible voice from God, personally addressing his son, Jesus. And then we also have uh, a third way that God communicates. And uh, what do I do with my eraser? Uh, huh, I'm not finding my eraser. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, let's see, I'll put it here. God uh, speaks words through human lips. Human lips. And so in this case, I have no idea where my, my eraser got raptured. Anyway, um, God speaks through human lips and frequently in the Bible, God raised up prophets. So he raised up prophets, prophets in the Old Testament. He raises up apostles in the New Testament to whom he speaks directly, but then he tells them to convey the message to others. And again, a few examples of this would be Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 20, where he, uh, he says, I will raise up from them, from the Israelites, a prophet like you, that is like Moses, uh, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. So there's a warning about if, you're, if, if God speaks to you and he tells you to say other things to someone else, it's going to be true. If it's prophetic, it's going to come true. Um, God's word is completely authoritative authoritative whether it comes from him or his words given to someone to convey to someone else. That's why every Sunday my focus in preaching, uh, all my videos uh, are, are done primarily focused on the fact that we have a Bible that God has revealed that is authoritative for everything we believe uh, for faith and practice in life. And I'm not giving you what I think, I'm giving you what God has declared. And, um, and the same thing goes for the prophets and the apostles. They did not declare their own, uh, what their own thoughts, their own words, but the words that were given to them by God with complete authority. Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 9 is another example of this, where uh, God says to Jeremiah, whatever I command you, you shall speak. And the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words into your mouth. So Wayne Grudem again comments, he says, Anyone who claimed to be speaking to the word uh, to, for the Lord, who had not received a message from him, was severely punished. And we see examples of this in Ezekiel 13, 1 through 7, and Deuteronomy 18, which we just looked at. There was no diminishing of the authority of these words when they were spoken through human lips. To disbelieve or disbe disobey any of these words was to disbelieve or disobey God himself. And then a fourth way that we see God's words are in written form. I'll put that over here. And that's the Bible. I'll just put Bible. But the Bible are God's words in written form. And uh, the translators, the, um, all those that copied the original manuscripts went to great pains uh, and took great pains to be able to get these words to us with total accuracy. And the study of textual criticism is amazing. You sort of just have to take my word for it, but you can check it out for yourself that the Bible, if you look at the Hebrew apparatus or the Greek apparatus, it has more evidence than any other holy book by far. There's just no comparison. And you can check it out for yourself. But I'm convinced that the Bible is God's word based on my own study of the original languages and how the Bible has been passed down. I'm convinced that we have the very word and original wording 
of God, the way he conveyed it uh, to prophets and apostles. Uh, so number four, uh, God's words in written form. Uh, an example of this would be Exodus 31, 18 and Exodus 32, 16, where he gave to Moses, God gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And of course, we know that God doesn't have a finger, but God has the ability uh, to speak and his words do uh, this activity. So like a decree, but in this case is a decree where it literally leads to being written on these stones by the God uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in us. And the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Further writing was done by Moses in Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 13, where it says, Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And to all the elders of Israel, and Moses commanded them at the end of Every seven years you shall read the law before all Israel in their hearing, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are going over to the Jordan to possess. And then Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26, this book which Moses wrote was the deposited was deposited by the side of the ark of the covenant where it says when Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book the, to the very end Moses commanded the levites who carried the ark of the covenant of the lord take this book of the law and put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of the lord your god that it may be there for a witness against you Further additions were made to this book of God's words. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God in Joshua 24, 26. God commanded Isaiah in Isaiah 38, now go write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. And to Jeremiah, God said, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. In the New Testament, Jesus promised his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come after he ascended into heaven to, uh, to bring to remembrance the words which he had spoken unto them. We see that in John 14, 26, as well as in John 16, 12, 13. And then Paul said that the very words he wrote to the Corinthians were a command of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 14, 37. So why, was, uh, why did God have his words written down in the Bible, 66 books from Genesis to Revelation? Why did he do that? Well, uh, there's a lot of reasons, but let me give you three benefits of having his word where we can actually see for ourselves what he said through prophets, through apostles. Uh, first, there is much more accurate preservation of God's words for subsequent generations. Uh, to depend on memory and the repeating of oral tradition is a less reliable method of preserving these words through history than it is recording it in writing. So in God's brilliance, uh, he revealed his words, he gave his words, he decreed his words, his word is in Jesus, and these things were written down so that to this very day, we can trust that what God has said is true, it's his revelation to us. A second benefit from writing down the words of God is the opportunity for repeated inspection of words that are written down permits careful study and discussion, which leads to better understanding and more complete obedience. I've been studying the Word of God since I was six years old, uh, so close to 50 years, and um, I'm still learning so much. Every time I open the Bible, I learn something new. It's a, it's a book that's alive, and God, I'm constantly going there to hear and listen to what God has to say to me. 
uh, today. Third, God's words in writing are accessible to many more people than they are when preserved merely through memory and repetition. So again, the word has been translated uh, literally in thousands of languages around the world and uh, less and less people groups uh, need the Word of God, but Wycliffe Bible Translators is one organization that is still continuing to translate the Bible into every language of the world. And uh, that's really good news because people can go and see for themselves in the Bible what God has said. So they can be inspected at any time by any person and are not limited in accessibility to those who have memorized them or those who are able to present them when they are recited orally. Thus, the reliability, permanence, and accessibility of the form, the written word, in which God's words are preserved are all greatly enhanced when they're written down. Yet, there is no indication that their authority or truthfulness is diminished. And then how does God speak in the present? This is how he's spoken in the past, which all of these were still beneficiaries of because we know about Jesus, the word in the Bible. We hear the decrees of God in the Bible. We hear how he personally addressed people in the Bible. We hear from human lips through prophets and apostles in the Bible, as well as Jesus. And so we have the Bible, but we also have uh, general revelation. And so uh, there's, there's two ways he, he speaks to us today. One is through general revelation. And this involves two things. One is through nature. God speaks to us through nature. And that's for everyone, not just believers, but every single human being. And then another way that God speaks is through our conscience. And the Bible usually calls this the heart. So nature and conscience. And this is called God's general revelation. Uh, so what's this mean? Well, it means that any human being that's born on planet Earth has two ways that God communicates to them outside of the Bible. And Romans 1 even says that God has so clearly manifested himself through nature, through what he has made, that man is without excuse as to saying he can't know that there's a God. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Let me give you one example of this. Psalm, uh, one nine, or Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, where the psalmist says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So uh, what this is saying is that God communicates through his creation, through what has been made, at, at the largest level, the stars, the universe, the galaxies, to the micro level of DNA in our bodies. This is all evidence of an intelligent designer. And then um, God also speaks revelation to everyone in our hearts, in our conscience. Revelation, or Romans 2, 15 and 16, puts it this way. The Apostle Paul says, They show that the work of the law is written on our hearts. In other words, we know right and wrong from just inside of us. While their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. What's Paul talking about? Well, if you go anywhere in the world, what you'll notice is that there are similar laws everywhere. It's always wrong to murder people. It's wrong to lie. It's wrong, wrong to cheat. It's wrong to steal. There, there's not a place you can go anywhere on the planet where certain things are not a part of our conscience, where when we do those things, as a matter of fact, thieves usually break in in the night. They don't want to be seen because what they're doing is wrong and they don't want to be caught for their wrongful acts. Uh, I've, I taught in a prison for a year at San Quentin 
And uh, while I was there, it was just interesting because most of the guys that I was teaching were there for pretty heinous crimes. Many of them had committed murder. And yet they all went in talking with them for five to 10 minutes. They would all make value judgments on other, on other prisoners even. And, and there was a hierarchy even among goodness and badness in the prison. And, and, and what that tells me is that we all have a conscience God gives us that conscience, and that's one of the reasons the world isn't as bad as it could be if we didn't have a conscience and general revelation. If we had no evidence of God, uh, then everything would be much worse than it is. And then, of course, finally, we have special revelation. So God speaks to us today through general revelation, and He speaks to us today through special revelation. And special revelation is only understood by believers, uh, and that is the Bible. That liberals can read the Bible, and what I mean by that is liberals don't believe in the authority of the scriptures, they don't believe in the inerrancy of scriptures, they don't believe in the supernatural. Liberals really don't understand the Bible because they demythologize everything. But in demythologizing it, they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And the reality is God is a God who does the miraculous. All you have to do again is just to look out and see creation. You just have to look out and see the complexity of humans and our conscience and that we have a soul. And all these things are debatable, but again, I think the evidence is very clear that there is a God, He made us in His image, he made us to know Him, and how we can know Him better is through reading uh, the revelation, the special revelation He's given us in the Bible. So I want to close with this, um, and in the weeks to come, I want to hone in then on how to uh, read the Bible in such a way that we're hearing from God. And so next week we're going to look at one of the key passages of how God speaks to us today from Hebrews chapter 1. But for right now, I want to close with these words. It's most profitable for us to study God's words as written in the Bible. It is God's written word that He commands us to study. The reader or student of the word is blessed with uh, uh, who meditates on God's law day and night. And that's from Psalms 1, 1 through 2. Psalm describes the, the man or the woman who reads the word day and night and meditates on it. It says they're blessed. And it says that they're like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. And so it's sort of like the, the picture of an oak tree that fires come, winds come, earthquakes come, and that oak tree still stands. It's dense because it's feeding from the water, it's gaining from the sun, and it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger over time. And so if you want to hear from God, the best place to go is to the Bible. And I encourage you to read the Bible every day. I love the Robert Murray McChain plan. That's what I do. And it allows you to read from four different passages of Scripture every day. You go through the whole Bible in a year. You go through Psalm, the Psalms twice and the Proverbs twice. And I, that's my favorite Bible plan. But every day I'm in there listening to God, hearing from God, looking at what He has to say. And next week, we're going to see more uh, how you personally can apply God's Word in your own life. Two more passages to read, and we'll close. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And I believe that means good success in righteous living. The goal of the Christian life is that we conform more and more to the image of Christ. And then lastly, I want to close with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which tells us that the Word of God is what we need to be equipped for every aspect of life. In the Word of God, in the form of written scripture, it says that it's breathed out by God. God gives us His very words in the Bible, and it's profitable. These words are profitable for teaching, 
That is doctrine, what to believe, theology. I believe that if you have good theology, everything else is going to be good. Your marriages are going to be good. Your relationships with your friends are going to be good. You're going to be a good worker. You're going to know how to be a husband. You're going to know how to be a wife. Wife. You're going to know how to be a good friend. You're going to, it covers everything. But first and foremost, you have to know what's God like and how has he designed us to be like him, to image him in this world. And so that's the teaching. Then it says it's also profitable for re reproof. We need to know what not to do. And there's a lot of things as sinners born with an inclination and a nature towards sin, we all need reproof. We all need discipline. Uh, we all need to know what does God's word say about everything. And um, apply that in our life. So we need to be reproved. Correction means don't do it this way, do it this way. And Paul talks a lot about this in Ephesians, for instance. He talks about putting off, what to put off, all, all the things of the flesh, all the things of the old man, that person that was us before salvation. And then he says, put this on. And it's all about the righteousness of Christ and how to be more like Christ and have the fruit of the Spirit. Put off, put on, that is correction. And then it's also good, the Bible is good for training in righteousness so that we are complete and equipped for every good work. So yes, God has spoken today. God has always spoken to man since the creation of Adam and Eve. He will always speak to us. His word will last forever. His word will always be something that we study. I believe if, even in heaven, we will be growing in the depths of the knowledge, the wisdom, uh, the application of that with God. And thank God we've heard from him. We have a handbook for living. And that handbook is this book, this Bible uh, from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books of revelation to the prophets and the apostles of what God wanted to convey. So that, yes, does God speak to us today? Yes, he primarily speaks to us through his word and through general revelation. God bless you. See you next time as we look into Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and how specifically we can hear from God practically today in our own personal time with God. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day or evening as you're watching this video. Take care.